Good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library, I would like to welcome you to the Ruth Ratner Miller Award of, for Excellence in American History, where we will honor the 2010 recipient of the award, Bernard Balin. This award was offered to the Concord Library in 2001 by Concord resident Richard Miller to honor the legacy of his mother, a founding member of the Holocaust Commission and Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., who believed that history was not merely desirable, but a civic and religious duty. Okay. Um, we hope that you'll join us for a reception and book signing following the program, where we'll, we will have copies of Dr. Balin's books, as well as the 375th Concord Anniversary Edition of Historic Concord, recently published by the Friends of the Library. It is now my pleasure to introduce Gordon Wood, who will be introducing Dr. Balin. Gordon S. Wood is the Alva O. Way University Professor Emeritus at Brown University. His book, The Creation of the American, American Republic, 1776 to 1787, won the Bancroft Prize in 1970. He received a Pulitzer Prize for history for the Radicalism of the American Revolution, and his volume in the Oxford History of the United States, Empire of Liberty, A History of the Early Republic, 1789 to 1815, received the Association of American Publishers Award for History and Biography in 2009. But perhaps even more importantly, he was born in Concord, a student of Bernard Balin, and was mentioned in the movie Goodwill Hunting in an exchange between Matt Damon and an obnoxious Harvard graduate student. <laughs> I'm sure that he himself was not an obnoxious Harvard graduate student, but Dr. Balin can give us the lowdown. It is my pleasure to present Gordon S. Wood. Welcome home. Well, thank you very much. It, I am delighted to be back here, although it, it's not as good as it sounds. I, uh, my, my parents owned a farm, a chicken farm in West Acton, and this was the closest place that had a hospital. So it sounds good, but uh, it's not quite what, what I would like. Um, so I'm delighted to be, be here, however, uh, and I'm also uh, delighted to be introducing Bernard Valen a special pleasure to, do, uh, to introduce him as this year's recipient of the Ruth uh, Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History. I can't think of any, uh, any American historian more worthy of this award. Now, it's a special pleasure, as you know, for me, because I was one of Balin's earliest graduate students at Harvard. Uh, when I entered Harvard's graduate program a long time ago, 1958, after three years in the Air Force, I was a very naive and ignorant uh, young guy. The only historian, the only faculty member at Harvard in the history department that I knew of was Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. And so that's who I was going to work with. I was going to work in modern American history. Of course, when I got there and I realized in 1958 that Schlesinger, Jr. was not at all interested in taking on graduate students. He was gearing up. He was involved, deeply involved, as you know, in democratic politics and was gearing up to, uh, for the 1960 election. At that point, he was supporting Adlai Stevenson. Um, so I, that, looked, uh, that looked bad for modern American history, but I had no intention, none whatsoever, to work in early American history. Like uh, many other graduate students, I thought of colonial history as a kind of quaint prologue to the main story, uh, the, an abridged mishmash of myths and folklore with no historical significance whatsoever. My undergraduate teacher uh, had actually skipped over the colonial period in, my, in our Morrison and Commager textbook, saying, well, this isn't very important. What comes after is much more important. So we just passed all over that. Um, but I had to take a research seminar, and uh, the choices were limited. I think it was between uh, Paul Buck uh, and this young scholar named Balin, who had just gotten tenure at Harvard. 
nobody in the world outside of Harvard had heard of him. Uh, but some of the second year students told us, uh, some of us uh, who were asking about what should we do, they said, you better take his seminar. Uh, so he says, it's a very exciting seminar. So about a dozen of us students signed up for it. And, and the rest, as we say, is, is history. Uh, the se seminar turned out to be very, very exciting indeed. We learned about not only early American history, but the way historians think. And I hadn't had the, a clue as to how, even though I was a history major as an undergraduate, I had no idea how historians think. And that seminar was an intellectual experience that none of us who took it, uh, I think, will, will ever forget. Now, you may all know about Balin's many prizes and distinguished books. Otherwise, you would not be uh, bestowing on him this, this uh, award for excellence in American history. Balin has won every award for history writing that our society grants, two Pulitzer Prizes, a Bancroft Prize, a National Book Award, and many other prizes. He was the Jefferson Lecturer in uh, 1998, and in 2000, he won the Bruce Catton Prize uh, awarded by the uh, Society of American Historians peers uh, for a lifetime achievement in the writing of history. Now, you all know that he is a distinguished historian, but perhaps you don't know what his fellow scholars know in early American history, how great his impact on the field of early American history has been. I wrote about this uh, in uh, his influence in a festschrift that uh, some of us back 20 years ago put together honoring uh, Bernard Balin. Let me just quote from one paragraph of my essay, which was entitled The Creative Imagination of Bernard Balin. Balin has made a difference, a permanent difference, in his field of early American history. He has transformed every aspect of the subject he has touched, from the social basis of colonial politics to early American educational history, from the origins of the American Revolution to early American immigration. Indeed, few, if any, American historians in the modern era of professional history writing have dominated their particular subject to the degree that Balin has dominated early American history over the past half century. And he's done so at a time when the field of early America has virtually exploded in numbers of books and monographs. And to expect any one scholar to come in with a book and change things is asking a lot. But Bernard Balin has done that. Uh, how can, it, no one scholar, how can one scholar make a difference given the, uh, this numerous number of books, but he has? Perhaps you know some of his books, and let me just mention a few of them. Uh, there are many, including several collections of his many articles, lectures, and, and essays. He began his book with his dissertation, New England Merchants in the 17th Century, um, an early anticipation uh, of the way in which the history of the Atlantic world has developed over the past two decades. He was anticipating this uh, more than a half century ago. His next book was small book, but powerful. Education in the Forming of American Society came out in 1960, which literally overnight transformed the history of American education, the way people wrote about education in, in America's past. His next major work was The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, came out in 1967 which is probably his most famous and influential work. It made him the leader of the so-called ideologi uh, ideological school of American historians, something that I'm sure annoys him to no end. Uh, and this was followed almost immediately by the origins of American politics, a down-to-earth study of the politics of the 18th century, a kind of companion, you might say, to the earlier intellectual study. His next book came out in 1974, uh, four, was called the ordeal of Thomas Hutchinson, the last civilian royal governor of this state, or this colony. It's my favorite book of, ba of Balin's, and, and I think it's the most artful and, and, and the most elegant of, of his many works. Balin next turned to his massive project of what he called the peopling of America, of, of British North America. In 1986, he published two works, one of, with that title, an introduction to the project, and another, a much larger study entitled Voyages to the West, a passage in the peopling of America on, on, on the eve of the revolution. This uh, won his second 
Pulitzer Prize, the first going to the ideological origins of the revolution. The book, of course, is a tour, to, if any of you have seen it, is a tour de force of historical presentation, combining, as it does, five different methods of presentation, descriptive exposition, quantitative tabulations, structural analysis, graphic representations, pictures, uh, and narratives of individuals and groups. Now, since then, as we wait eagerly for another volume in this People of America project, Balin has spent a great deal of, of time in retirement uh, at, at, at Harvard running an international Atlantic World Seminar. Uh, every year, over the past two decades or so, he has invited young scholars from all over the world interested in Atlantic history in the early modern period between 1500 and 1800 to present their work. He has been extraordinarily generous with his time and his energy. The seminar has resulted in a remarkable expansion of that field of Atlantic history to the point where academic positions are now advertised in that field alone. Balin himself has written a short book on the subject and edited others. But his real achievement, I think, is the encouragement his seminar has given to so many young scholars. So you can see that you have chosen wisely in awarding Pres uh, Professor Balin this year's Miller Award. Please join me in applauding this most eminent historian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish my mother could have heard that. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. With uh, students like this, you don't need teaching. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here um, in Concord and here again. I was here last year when we had a, a session on David Donald, and I was able to talk about his uh, career. Uh, but I have very warm feelings towards uh, Concord, uh, partly because our younger son went to Concord Academy. And uh, as a consequence for those three years, we were here a lot and got to know the community some and got to know the school extremely well. And uh, he loved it. And I think one of the reasons, <laughs> I think one of the reasons he loved it is that he was an aspiring athlete, but it was a girls' school. <laughs> and he was in the first class that allowed boys in. So he became an athletic hero. <laughs> uh, but uh, he loved the school, too. And uh, it was a great success for him and indirectly for us. Uh, I'm really very honored to uh, have this award, anything associated uh, with uh, Dr. Miller's work uh, in any way. Her aspirations and her achievements uh, is a very great honor. And I, I recognize this, and I am very appreciative. Um, I thought I would speak rather informally um, about uh, historians and what historians do uh, professionally uh, and what some of the problems are that they face. I think historians are a very nervous bunch. Uh, they're always worried about their field. They always seem to be worried about whether it really makes any sense to do history, whether you can do history. And they have all sorts of reservations and philosophical discourses on doing history. Uh, and uh, it is a major concern. I don't think any uh, historian of accomplishment uh, has given up without writing some book or article on the nature of historical study and let it go at that. Uh, it's a very self-conscious group, and they're very much concerned with certain kinds of problems. Uh, and uh, I thought I would mention a couple of them and uh, illustrate it, some of these problems, with uh, some few words on the Constitution. Uh, historians are forever concerned about objectivity. This has gone back X number of generations. 
of historians wondering about whether there is possible a perfect objectivity in what they do. They are people. They draw their own prejudices and their own backgrounds into whatever they do. There is no such thing as a perfect objectivity, and they are much concerned about this. And uh, they write about this a great deal. And there has been a whole literature on the failure of objectivity in historical study. And another one they worry about, of course, are sources. Some subjects you simply can't get a hold of because the sources aren't there. You can't get into mental states very clear. There's some kind of uh, demographic subjects that can't be touched for lack of sources. Now, I have to tell you, just to take those two examples, that neither of those bother me very much. Uh, I once got... <laughs> Uh, I once got into a discussion uh, with a very philosophical guy on the nature of historical study. And when we got through with this, he dismissed me. He said, you're an aw shucks epistemologist. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means, but I think I am. I don't take these things very seriously. I know bias when I see it. And in large scale historical writings, I can, I can account for this. And in technical monographic studies, I'm not troubled by the bias that's built into very technical, refined points of documentation because if it's worth bothering with, somebody else is going to come along with a dialectical opposition to it, and the, the truth of this will be revealed. I, I just don't get very excited about the problem of objectivity. You know, it's a bit Robert Solo, the economist at MIT, uh, once said, uh, which I, I, I take, in a way, applied to this. Uh, he said, the fact that there's no perfect antisepsis is no reason to do brain surgery in a sewer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is no objectivity, but you don't give up. I mean, you, you do the best you can. You make the best approximation you can to what you take to be what actually happened. And you, you know that you won't get it 100%, but you do it pretty well. And as for sources, um, what strikes me about sources is quite the opposite. I'm astonished these days at the amount of new sources we get. When I wrote The Ideological Origins, I had to go through about 400 or 500 pamphlets in order to get the basis for that book. Harvard's a great library. I was very lucky to be at Harvard because it had so many of these documents, but it didn't have them all. And I had to go all over the place to get them. And I wrote to libraries here and there, and I went to England, and I went all over to collect these documents. They're all online now. <laughs> I mean it, literally. I mean, I can click on any one of these. The entire corpus of printed documentation in North America from the beginning until 1820 is in a single composite uh, database which you can access and search. I mean, that is, is just a different world from what I was doing before. And other kinds of literary materials are gathered together in, um, in electronic forms which you never could have gotten hold of. And all sorts of other things are now being made available. For example, there's no way of getting a real picture of life of the Aboriginal North Americans before contact with Europe because there's no written record. But they've got around that by the study, by what's called ossuary studies, namely the study of bones. And they have come up with the most astonishing things. Life expectancy, nutrition, uh, patterns of life that can be gained through this. What strikes me about sources is not the lack of sources, but the mountains of sources we now have, which are really quite intimidating uh, on areas that we thought previously we couldn't touch. And there are other areas like that. So I am, to tell you the truth, I am not worried by these classical problems of uh, historical study, but I am troubled by one particular aspect of historical study, which is simpler to describe. 
It's a very elemental thing and it is unsolvable. Namely, that historians know how it all came out. But the people of the time didn't. And the most important things in their lives was the uncertainty. We haven't got a clue as to what's going to happen in Iran. We don't even know what's going to happen next week, sort of. <laughs> uh, it is the uncertainty and the complications of their lives uh, which historians know the outcome of. And the people at the time couldn't have. And that's the biggest thing in their lives. The consequence of this is that historians, to find out how it got to be the way it got, trace the antecedents of that outcome. That's what historians do for a living. They take the origins of the First World War, or whatever you're studying, and you don't want to know why there was a world war? Well, they go back to the antecedents of it, and they trace a line of events and documents and people and decisions and so forth, and they can then explain to you why you had World War I. The problem with this is that it becomes inevitable. It's an, it's an inevitability that's built into the stories they tell because of this process. And that is what troubles me about historical study. And there's no way to overcome this, really, as far as I can see, except to recognize the contingencies, the uncertainties, all the accidents that went into this. There's no straight line development. It goes through all sorts of contortions that are wiped clean out when you simply take the outcome and trace the antecedents of it. That's what troubles me in historical study, because it falsifies what happened. There are many illustrations of this, and I want to spend a few minutes, and I won't bore you with a lecture on the Constitution, but uh, I do want to say a few words about the Constitution in that precise connection, because it's such a beautiful example of, of this. Um, when uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Constitution, Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, wrote the following. He said that the American Constitution was the most remarkable work in modern times produced by the human intellect at a single stroke. Well, they got some of that right. <laughs> it is the work of the human mind, that's for sure. And it's really a magnificent document. But it was not done at a single stroke. The American Constitution was written in four major phases. It was written in Philadelphia, where it was drafted. It was then modified significantly in the whole ratification process, which followed for 10 months by which the states ratified the Constitution. It was then rewritten in certain parts in the first Congress. The Bill of Rights comes from the first Congress. The Judiciary Act rewrote part three of the Constitution. And it was again enacted by Washington in his two terms in ways that fundamentally shaped it. There's no single stroke in this. And further, when you look back as to how this happened, there was no design. We have now the idea that this is a structured and well-designed thing, a program of government. But in fact, it is the process of one of the most complicated and involuted processes I've ever traced, in which people didn't, they only had two ideas in mind. They had no design. The ones who had designs in mind found that they, they collapsed within a week of the convening of the convention. They had two ideas in mind. One was to build a strong central government, which was paradoxical because they had just fought a war to get rid of one. And secondly, to protect the people against the government they were creating. Those are the two things they had in mind. How you do this, what the design would be, they had no idea. And it is a process of fumbling and backtracking, 
stopping cold on a certain point, then going back, bringing it up later when the situation has shifted, and then finally coming to some resolution or dumping it. And the Constitution was not a great, in all ways, a great success. As you know, there are parts of the Constitution that are a complete failure, like the Electoral College, which never once worked, not once worked. Washington was elected by acclamation. And after that, the party system entered in significantly to affect how, how, we, uh, how we nominate the executive. Uh, some things in it work partly had to be modified uh, and uh, inch by inch uh, and with all sorts of arguments and personality clashes, they finally got what is more or less acceptable to the majority. Three people, very active in the convention, refused to sign it because they couldn't accept the powers that were created. Let me give you two very quick examples of uh, how this worked. Uh, we had to have an army. So then the question came up, well, how big? So this is in the documentation of the, of the convention. So Elbridge Gerry was in more or less in charge of this for a while. And he looked around, he said, well, uh, standing army, what has it got to do? It doesn't have to do much, it has to do this at 2,000. So then somebody said, well, <laughs> okay, in peacetime, maybe 2,000, 3,000, that's not very many. What happens if you have an attack? You have to mobilize a big wartime army. You can't do this overnight. You have to have a bigger army. So I said, okay, 20,000. <laughs> so this is silly. I mean, they couldn't get anywhere with this. So they switched gears completely, totally involuted the whole subject, and they came up with that complicated provision in the Constitution uh, that says, uh, Article 1, Section 8, I see the shift of mind that goes into this, which seems to be typical of what was going on. That clause reads, Congress will have the power to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Now look what's happened. They've given the executive the right to create an army of any size he wants, so long as Congress has a check on it through financing. Now, of course, at present, it takes eight years to make a weapon system. So you can't do it in two years, but you know, we make laws to take care of that kind of thing. But that was the way they kept thinking about this. And it seems to me it's typical of the switches that took place. And it is no straight line thinking about this. They went backwards and forwards and cross-checked each other. Let me give you another example, which I find extremely intriguing and which by constitutional historians, I don't know why, maybe some of you are constitutional historians, I don't know why nobody ever talks about this. In my opinion, it's one of the most basic parts of the entire Constitution. It's a small clause, a very small clause, in uh, Article 1, Section 6. Uh, it reads the following. It's tossed in at the end of that part with an and. They're talking about other things. And then they say, and, quote, no person holding an office under the United States that is a member of the executive, that is, holding an office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. That seems to me the ball game on the division of powers, separation of powers. That is the ball game. Because if you have plural office holding, a single person, as in Britain, a single person is in the executive and in the House of Commons at the same time, you have a totally different constitutional system. It's absolutely basic. But if you go into the records, 
of the Constitutional Convention, it is the most amazing debate that took place on this. The debate had nothing to do with the separation of powers. I don't know, they were smarter than I am, they must have seen this. But what they talked about was something entirely different. Hamilton started this off and Hamilton said, if you do that, if you prevent someone in the executive from sitting in the legislature, you will discourage good men from going into government. That seems to me a kind of an argument, but that isn't the point. The point is that it bears directly on the separation of powers. And I can't understand why they didn't discuss it that way, but they didn't. So it, it is a process that's really very complicated and you have to account for those complications. In the end, of course, what they end up with, as you know, was a feeling that they had failed on the point of the protection against the government and that there would have to be greater protections than the Constitution has, and that radiates all the way through the ratification process, and in the end, as you know, ends with the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was the product of the ratification process in which the various states indicated their discontent with the Constitution, largely because it didn't protect people properly from the powers that had been, been created. And they were covered, these people were covered with fears. They didn't know what would happen. The Senate was too powerful. They had a whole string of things. And then odd fears popped up. In North Carolina, someone wrote a pamphlet on the observation that there, which is true, that there's nothing in the Constitution that prevents the Pope from becoming president. <laughs> that is true. There isn't. So James Iredell, who was one of the smartest jurists in the country, he ended up on the Supreme Court, a very smart man, <laughs> wrote a reply as follows, quote, I confess this never struck me before. And if the author had read all the qualifications of a president, perhaps his fears might have been quieted. No man but a native, and who has resided 14 years in America, can be chosen president. I know not all the qualifications for being a pope, <laughs> but I believe he must, have taken from, he must be taken from the College of Cardinals. A native of America must have had singular good fortune, who, after residing 14 years in his own country should go to Europe, enter into Romish orders, obtain the promotion to cardinal, afterwards that of pope, and at, and at length be so much in the confidence of his own country as to be elected president. <laughs> it would be even, <laughs> it would be even more extraordinary if he should give up his popedom for our presidency. <laughs> it was, but their main fear, of course, uh, was that the powers were too great uh, and they wanted to modify uh, the Constitution to give us greater protection against the government and which ended, as I said, and as you know, in the Bill of Rights. But that was a difficult problem, and I'll, let me end this passage with this. Um, the following problem. Uh, when they came state by state to ratify, uh, they had ideas how, it should, how the Constitution should be amended, but how do you do it? If you ratify it, qualifying the ratification by saying, so long as you add X, Y, Z, then you're ratifying a document that was not passed in Philadelphia. It's something different. And uh, the contingent ratification was a, a problem for many weeks they couldn't overcome. And finally, the resolution to this was that the states would ratify with recommended, with recommended amendments. That is, they would absolutely ratify the Constitution, but they would make recommendations to the first Congress 
for amendments which became the Bill of Rights. But the problem is that a lot of people didn't like that idea for a simple reason. They didn't know what this first Congress would do. Who knew what they would do? You could recommend anything under the sun, but you don't know what they would do. So they were very leery of this, and they had to force through the idea in the states that they ratify and recommend, not demand, that they recommend changes. The crisis came in January 1788 when Massachusetts, which was anti-constitution, that is, uh, it was anti-federalist mainly, three states were holding out, uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York. If any one of them didn't ratify the Constitution, you'd have had no Constitution and you'd have a British passport. Um, it came to Massachusetts in January, late January, 1788, uh, with a desperate effort to get uh, the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention to agree simply to recommend changes. If Massachusetts did that, the rest would follow. Now the problem with this was that the majority was against doing this. And the only person who had sufficient political clout to make a difference was the governor, who was John Hancock. And John Hancock, caught up in this terrible debate that was going on in the convention, um, had the gout. Now, John Hancock often had the gout, especially when the politics got difficult. <laughs> and this was a terrible problem of getting, uh, getting through this impasse on the Constitution. So he wasn't at the debate, he was home with his gout. So a little committee formed of Federalists who knew their way around, <laughs> as happens in Boston politics, and they paid a visit to Hancock. And they said to him, look, uh, if you go to the convention and make a speech endorsing the Constitution with recommended changes, we'll support you in the next gubernatorial election. And furthermore, maybe if Washington doesn't stand for the presidency, maybe we'll suggest your name. <laughs> that had a terrific effect on his gout. <laughs> he quickly recovered from his gout. He went to the, and he made a flaming oration. <laughs> about ratifying with recommendations, and it went through, not by a big margin, but it got through comfortably. And that was the form that it took. Well, what I'm saying in these illustrations is simply the idea that we have a perfectly designed instrument of government, and you can trace its antecedents back and show the inevitability. There was no inevitability about the Constitution. There was no inevitability that it would be ratified. If I had to bet on it at the beginning of the ratification, I would have bet against it. All the odds were against it. And it's a product of just what I'm saying, fooling around with Hancock's gout and a few other things uh, that account in the end for how this got through. It's the contingencies and it's the losers who you have to pay attention to because their failures shape the successes. And in order truly to understand the uncertainties of the time and consequently the real process by which all of this happened, you cannot think in terms of a determined line of development that led to that outcome. That outcome was the product of contingencies, of people's efforts in all sorts of directions, which I think is the proper role of the historian in order to show. But it is difficult and how to sustain a narrative while doing all of that is the core problem, in my view, of historical writing, namely at least narrative writing, to be able to show the narrative and at the same time to show all of the nuance and failures and losses and personality clashes and all the rest of it that went into it and still maintain a clear line of narrative. 
That's the tough part of doing history, it seems to me. And I don't care about objectivity, and I'm overwhelmed with this, so I don't want any more sources. I got too many. So that seems to me uh, to be an uh, essential core element in historical study. But yet, when you're through with all of this, uh, certain principles do emerge. Uh, and uh, Madison's role in this, and I'll conclude with this, I don't want to talk too long. Uh, Madison's role in this was strange. I have to say a word about that before I close shop here. Uh, he was, of course, as people say, the father of the Constitution. Well, he voted on 71 issues in the convention, and he was defeated on 40. When Madison was through with the whole process, he wrote the Bill of Rights, as you know, and he had, it was a great figure. To him, the Constitution was, in a very major way, a failure. It had one deep defect, which he tried again and again to correct and never was able to do it. It came up three times in the course of his career. It was the question that the Bill of Rights and all the protections are protect, protections of the people as against the federal government. As you know, that's what the Bill of Rights is. It's the protections against the federal government. But who is to protect you against the state governments? There's nothing in the Constitution that says anything about that. And furthermore, there is no appellate jurisdiction in the Constitution cases in the state going up into the federal level so that it, the state could be controlled. And from his point of view, that is the deepest failure of the Constitution. There is nothing in it that protects people against the activities of the state governments. He died in 1837, I think, 36 or 37. 30 years later, he finally, that finally was written into the Constitution. That's the 14th Amendment. It is the 14th Amendment that he wanted all his life, from the beginning of the convention, all the way through the ratification process, in writing the Bills of Right, in the first Congress, he did again and again, and he could never get it through because the states wouldn't allow it. It took the Civil War to make that possible. The 14th Amendment is what Madison wanted all his life and never got. But he knew the essential of what had been achieved. And there's an interesting passage um, years after he was president uh, in repose when he thought about all of these matters. He tried to sum up the whole generation's work in a single few sentences, which he did in the following way which he thought summarized the achievement of the American Revolution. He said, in Europe, charters of liberty have been granted by power. America has set the example of power granted by liberty. This revolution in the practice of the world may be pronounced the most triumphant turning point of its history and the most consoling presage of its happiness. Period. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please join us for the reception in um, the reference room, as well as have a chance to uh, chat with uh, Professor Balin, and um, and he'll be signing some of his books. Um, and in the program, you will have seen uh, a description of the, uh, the physical award, which is a beautiful engraving by Barber of uh, Concord Center. So we will.
present this to him. Thank you.